Everybody, you decided to join us this morning. We just want to invite you to stand to your feet as we step into this time of worship.
declare that only you are worthy, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Lord. I am an instrument of exaltation, and I was born to lift your name above all names. You You chose to hear my heart when I breathe. Who else is worthy? Who else is worthy? There is no one, only you, Jesus. Who else is worthy? Who else is worthy?
throne. He's worthy this morning, church. He's worthy to receive all the praise, the glory, and the honor. Father, we're just thankful, God, for all of who you are, Lord. We continue, God, as we've been doing for these past few weeks, just to sing you're worthy, you're holy, you're matchless, Lord. And this morning, as we prepare in a few weeks to enter into our Easter season and Palm Sunday, I just want to reflect on him and his sacrifice. And this next song is just continuing to just sing how worthy he is. We lay our crowns before him. And so as we just navigate through this song, just picture just the Lord dying for you, dying for me. And the, best news net, the best news yet raising up for you and for me. And so it goes like this. We crown you. We fall face down and we worship. We all cry out. You are worthy, God. You are worthy, God. Oh, we crown you. We fall face down and we worship. We all cry out. You are worthy, God. You are worthy. Come on, can we sing that church? Sing, we crown you. We fall face down and we worship. We all cry out. You are worthy, God. Yes, you are. You are worthy, God. One more time, we crown you. Yeah, we fall face down and we worship. We all cry out, you are worthy, God. Yeah. You are worthy, God. We crown you this Just made us 
atonement for us to the son who overcame all the power of death we pray for the stripes for the wounds for the beating you bore for the tears for the blood that was willingly poured for the mercy for wonderful majesty
Come on, right there. Let's take a few moments there. Come on. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. Come on. He's here. He's here as we acknowledge him. Come on. Whatever you need, he's in the room today. He's in the room today. Let's raise it up with everything we have this morning. Come on. Oh, 
the Lamb is overcome. Hey, we sing, we sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. Oh, the Lamb is overcome. We sing, we sing hallelujah. Yeah. Come on, raise it up. Hallelujah. The Lamb. Earth. 
In this story, we get to see Mary, a virgin, be confronted by an angel. And her response to this angel that tells her that she's going to carry the Savior of the world is, but I'm a virgin. How what am I supposed to do that? Mary ends up carrying this baby boy in her belly, gives birth to the Messiah who grows up for 33 years, lives on this earth to die on the cross, resurrect three days later so that you and I can live a healed and free life. Amen. When Jesus ascends back to heaven, he says something very special. He says, I'm leaving you with a gift. And if you know what I'm talking about, I pray that you've had ears to hear the Holy Spirit speaking to you throughout this service. But this gift that he leaves behind for you and for me is the gift of the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us every single day, speaking, teaching, correcting, guiding, molding. And this is the Spirit of God that you are hearing from today. For every generation in this house, doesn't matter how old you are, the Holy Spirit is here and is speaking to you. After Mary says, I'm a virgin, the angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And I'm believing that to be a prophetic word today for someone in the room who thinks I have never done that. I can't do it. I'm a virgin. I've never been there. I don't understand. I wasn't taught how to do that. I wasn't trained in that way. My dad wasn't a pastor. I wasn't raised up in this. I believe that the Holy Spirit is going to overtake you and overshadow you. And that everything you thought you could do in your own might is going to be done by the Holy Spirit. Amen? So we're just going to close our eyes. We're going to lift our hands up to heaven right now. We're going to believe that the Holy Spirit is going to begin to speak to us right now. Like if an angel was standing right in front of your face, the Holy Spirit is going to begin to speak to you. going to reveal to you all the places where he is going to overshadow you, your will, your thoughts, your knowledge, your strength. It's going to overtake you right now in the name of Jesus. God, we thank you because you're good. We thank you because you're ahead of us. Because you know our past and you know our future. Walk before us, beside us, and behind us. You've never left us nor forsaken us. You see us right where we are, and you're so proud. You love the sons and daughters in this room. You're not angry with us. God, that as we walk out of this auditorium today, that we'd feel you in the sun in our cheeks, Lord.
Amen and amen and amen. I'm going to give you all a chance to say hi to someone next to you. Go ahead and take your seat. the opportunity to look at so many beautiful and smiling faces. If you have not met me yet, we have not gotten the chance to meet. My name is Pastor Tina. I have the honor and the privilege to be married to Pastor Rich, lead pastor here of Generation Church. As Next Gen and G Kids walk out of the church, let's just make some noise for them. Our next generation leading the way in their schools inviting their friends to church. Let me tell you something. We have something to learn from these kids, right, who invite all their friends to church. They're not shy about it. I have an amazing group, they say. Come to Next Gen. We're going to camp this summer. It's going to be so good. We're so, we're so hyped and ready. So if you didn't see outside, we actually have um, iced coffee. Amen for some iced coffee, right? I mean, it's a cold auditorium, but outside, the next-gen kids are making iced coffee, taking donations for their conference. They're going to be going to Bush Gardens, but they are going to also meet Jesus, which is so important. They're going to have a moment with God, and we're so excited for them to do that. But anyway, if it is your first time here, we want to meet you. We want to get to know you. You probably received a Connect card on your way in. It's a white card with some confetti on it. Go ahead, fill it out, make your way out to the Connect Tent right outside. Uh, we have a gift for you. I will spoil a surprise and tell you that that gift is merch. So you want to go and pick up your t-shirt. Uh, lucky you, right? You get to get something today. So go ahead and make your way out there. If you're watching for the first time online today, we want you to go ahead and text Generation Home to 970 Zero, zero, so you can connect with us here at Generation Church. As we continue right behind me on screen are going to be ways to give. We are a generous church, a church that gives, and we are so proud of y'all. I mean, week after week, we're just so thankful with the trust and the blessing that has come over this church. We're so grateful to be able to be a part of this community. Amen. And while you prepare your giving, I have a few announcements for you. If you didn't know, we are in springtime, right? Spring has officially begun, and that means Easter is coming. It's a big deal, y'all. It's a big deal. That was not good enough. Next week is Palm Sunday, right? And then we begin Holy Week. Right, so that means that we're gonna have a bunch going on at our church. Go ahead, get on our church center app. You have to connect to our church here, Generation Church, and you're gonna see all the info of what's happening coming up soon um, right there. You can also sign up for events like uh, which service you'll be attending Sunday morning that helps us prepare for Easter egg hunts and all the good stuff. We're gonna have bounce houses, food trucks, all the, all the fun things, right? Uh, but you can also go on and register for a meeting that we have today, right after this service. The meeting that we have today is for anyone who's not part of home team, but wants to serve the community on Easter Sunday. You think, you know what, I've been saved long enough, right? Today is the day that I'm going to make a decision to serve my community so that someone far from God would find Jesus, right? So that someone could be established forever, right? So that someone could know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. So you're going to come to the meeting right after service, right in here in the auditorium, and we're going to give you a rundown of Easter logistics. It's going to be great. If you're a planner, you're going to love it. If you're not a planner, just come, get a coffee, enjoy, right? It's going to be a great meeting. We cannot wait to see you. There's so much happening on campus. Uh, but next is Pastor Rich. He's going to come and share an incredible word. So let's prepare ourselves and prepare our hearts. All right, all right, all right. Come on, church. How we doing today? Man, y'all look amazing. And um, it's, a, it's an awesome, awesome time here at Generation. And I'm so glad you're here. So glad you're a part. So, 
glad that you're seeing all that the Lord is doing and how he's moving. And even just uh, this morning, 9 a.m. was incredible. And I know that he's going to move just the same, if not better, here at the 11. And so, man, we are, we're in a series. And this series has been a blessing to this house. And if you're new here or first time here, you're watching online, I love you. And I'm so glad you're having church wherever you're having church. Lean in. We've got a team ready to serve you and your family right where you are. And if you're here for the first time today or if you're new, been coming around for a little bit, we're in a series called The, the, the Awe of God. But we're just taking weeks at a time to study on this topic of the fear of the Lord. Has it been blessing you so far? And I couldn't think of a better series that as we posture ourselves in prayer and in focus for revival in 2024, that we learn as a community what the fear of God is. And man, it's been blessing me tremendously. And I pray it's been doing the same for you. And um, I just want to say in this season of Easter and spring, um, get into the posture of prayer for your loved ones, for your families, your friends, people that you're believing to come with you to church on Easter weekend, whether it's on Good Friday or it's at any of the services that we have on that weekend or Palm Sunday next weekend, whatever that looks like. Listen, we see revival. We all pray for it. We all have friends. We all have loved ones. We all have people in our lives that we know need the gospel. What an opportunity we all have to just be emboldened by the Holy Spirit to go ahead and invite someone and be kind to someone. And I just want to say this. Maybe you don't know this, but statistics prove that all year round, people will say no to you to go to church. But there's one invitation that most people say yes to, and that's that Easter invite. So be emboldened, get some courage, invite them, pray for them, right? And hopefully they encounter Christ when they get here. Amen. You excited? Make sure you RSVP for the service you're coming to, but we're believing for revival. You ready for God's word? This series has been incredible. And, um, you know, I, I pray that it, it, it goes and it grows deeper than just a sermon series here at our church. But that it's something that we hold dear to and we live with and we continually practice, which is walking in holy fear. And week one was just an introduction to what the fear of God is. And we learned that the fear of God, in essence, is reverence unto God. And how we can walk in that every single day. Week two, we understood the, the three images that we all navigate. The perceived image, the projected image, and then our actual image. And how according to scripture, we are revealed as we are. How many know there's nothing we can hide from God? Come on. He knows our innermost, deepest desires. He knows our motives. He knows all of our thoughts. And then we are invited to just live a truthful version of ourselves unto God. Week three on Legacy Sunday, which by the way, Legacy is incredible. Thank you for giving here and for being a part of what we're building here. But on Legacy Sunday, we discovered the benefits of living a lifestyle of holy fear. The promises that are attached to you living with the fear of the Lord. And last Sunday, God moved tremendously if you were here had a beautiful time at the altar all together, but it was a study on the fear of man. We were set free from living for the opinion of man, and we're walking and living in that freedom today, by the way. We are not enslaved by that snare anymore. There is a fountain of life for those that know how to fear God. And today, if you're taking notes, we've titled this conversation, Our Response to God's Word. The awe of God, our response to God's word. And next Sunday, we'll be finishing the series on Palm Sunday. So I'm excited. Be here. Get ready for it. It's going to be a great kickoff to Holy Week. But today, it's our response to God's word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your holy word. We thank you that we can open it and approach it as we are. And our prayer today, Lord, is that you speak, that you have your way that you bring deliverance into this house, that you set us free today. 
that you bring peace, you bring encouragement, that you bring hope, Lord, as we look at the person of Jesus today, God. And we thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you that he died for us and rose for us. And thank you that because he lives, we now live. And we bless your holy name, Abba. We thank you. Holy Spirit, speak. We're listening. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Come on, church. Amen. Here's what we know and we've been defining. A person who walks in holy fear, the fear of God, builds their lives on the word of God. We don't build on opinion. We don't build on ideas. We build our lives on and in God's word. And the fear of the Lord can be broken down into two categories. We've talked a lot at length about this. But two definitions. The first one is that we tremble at God's presence. And the second one is that we tremble at God's word. Now this idea of tremble is not in the posture of I'm afraid of God in his presence. or I'm afraid of his word. But it's the idea of the fear and reverence unto his presence. And the reverence unto his word. And that his word is alive. Come on. The Bible says that the words of the Father are a breath unto us. That it is our daily bread. Come on, somebody. That we are to live each and every day with God's word. And today we're, we're studying and looking at this idea together of how it is that we tremble at God's word. If you want to grow in the fear of the Lord, we need to discover how to respond to the word of God. Amen. The word of God, every time you'll open it, every time you read it, it'll serve as a double-edged sword. You fight in this life with it, but as you fight it also, come on, pierces our soul and our hearts to make us more like Christ. And it's this word that every time we come at it, we can be challenged by it. We can be empowered through it. We are encouraged. We are convicted. And we are to walk in discipleship with the Lord. I want to set this message up with this text out of Isaiah 66. And throughout all the history of Scripture, there are seasons in life where God's people will, dr will drift away from a real authentic relationship with God. And that's not just exclusive to the people of the Bible. It happens in our lives too. There are moments where we can walk far from God. We can drift from God. And this can look a lot of different ways. But in Isaiah 66, there was a moment within the people of God where they had drifted from their relationship. And they had just really placed mere formalities to commune with God. In essence, they got real selective real selective with their obedience unto God. In Isaiah 66, we see God address the people of the Lord who had attempted to develop and to maintain a relationship with him on their own terms. And what's interesting about this text is that even though they're worshiping God on their own terms and being selective with their obedience, Yahweh, God himself, provides them a path to course correct. This is amazing because it's the grace of God and the mercy of God before us to course correct to now enter into an authentic relationship with Jesus, with the Lord. Isaiah 66 verse 1 and 2 says, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me and where is the place of my rest? Verse 2, for all those things my hand has made and all those things exist. Says the Lord, but on this one I will look. Your translation may say, this one I will bless. On him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. Notice the three virtues that he highlights. This is the person who he'll bless. This is the person who he will look close to. Those with a poor spirit, a contrite heart, and who trembles at his word. The term I will bless in the Hebrew is the term nabat, which means defined to look, to watch, and to regard. In this sense, we're looking at what God is saying, I will pay close attention to those. 
I will bless those. I will keep in regard those who live humbly, have a contrite heart, and who tremble at my word. Amen. And I want us to take a deep dive today on what it looks like to tremble at God's word. The one who trembles at God's word always exalts what he says above anything else. What he says above anything else. Nothing else, no one else is more important. And this is the evidence of holy fear. And the Bible says those who live like this will be blessed. Philippians chapter 2 is a foundational passage to our Christian faith. When it comes to our theology, Philippians 2, the entire chapter, is instrumental and it will bless you and it will change us. In chapter 2, verse 12, Paul writes, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. As you've always obeyed, not just in my, with my presence, but even in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Paul is not just writing this scripture to the church of Philippi. This is God speaking directly to you and me today. And that we are to focus on these words, always obeyed. Always obeyed means unconditional obedience. Unconditional obedience. Whether we feel his presence or we don't feel his presence, we always obey unconditionally. And I want to just bring a disclaimer to you today. This is going to be a difficult message to hear. And I'm thankful for it because we're going to walk out of here changed today. I truly believe that. But I'm sending this up via God's word because I, I truly believe that we are all called to grow in our discipleship. We are all called to grow in our fear of God and live the way he's called us to live. And what Paul is saying here, whether you feel the presence of God or you don't in a moment, we always obey. Whether we see God moving or we don't see him moving, we obey. Whether our prayer is being answered on our timeline or within our expected timeline, whether we see it or we don't, we obey. Because he, here's what's truth. It's easy to obey when we're on the mountaintops of life. It's easy to obey in a conference. It is easy to obey in a church service where we tangibly feel the manifested presence of God. Right? In a church service, we can say, yes, Lord, I will go. In a church service, it's like, yes, Lord, I'll plant this church. I will go to Zambia. I, I will go where nobody's going. But on Tuesday morning... It might feel a little different. It might look a little different, right? We, we don't have the worship team. We don't have Larry on the keys leading us to heaven, right? And so it might be a little bit different because in church, the setting, the presence of God is strong. We're connecting. We're intentional. When things go our way, we say yes. When we're, our life is going good, we say yes. But what about when? We don't tangibly feel God with us. Do we obey God when we're tempted, when we're tried, when we're in a trial? What does that look like for us? When a team member lies about you and through that lie you're fired from your position. You feel betrayed. Will you forgive according to his word? Or retaliate to get even? Do we obey God's word or do we let our emotions direct our lives? When you're on a business trip and it's an extended business trip and you feel lonely and right before you boarded that flight, you were in discord or in, in disagreement with your spouse and there's been criticism of you and now a team member of the opposite sex at this job, at this business trip approaches you and says all the right things and speaks to your need. And now there's an opportunity to spend an evening together. No one will ever know. No one will ever find out. Will you flee or do you obey the word of God? 
If you're working late on your computer and you're searching the internet for the sake of the information you need to finish your job, to, to put the project together, and all of a sudden you come across pornography, do you engage or do you obey God's word? These are all moments that are not just exclusive to someone. It's all in our everyday life. So do we always obey according to Philippians 2, God's word, because we walk in holy fear, or is it conditional in our lives? These are instances in our everyday lives where God's presence may seem absent or far or different from what we can experience in the gathering of the saints and through communion. If you tremble at his word, you will obey God no matter the circumstance. You will obey God because there is no greater precedence in your life. And when you obey God in every circumstance, it indicates that you walk with holy fear. Now, I don't want you to hear me today with ears of filled with condemnation because no, not one of us is perfect. I have failed many times, but we are all on journey we are all in discipleship. We are all, right, growing and, 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 and getting closer to Jesus. But one thing that you'll hear a lot within the next 20 minutes today is that we have a choice to make in this life. And the choice is either we can stay where we are, we can remain as we are, or we can accept the open invitation, right, to receive all that God has for us and to become who he says we are. Right? We can become like Jesus. We can do what Jesus does, not through willpower, not because I'm telling you to do so, not because someone's telling you to do so. It's because the Holy Spirit lives in you and every day gives you an opportunity to choose. All over scripture, the Bible says you can choose life or you can choose death. You can choose blessing or you can choose curse. Choose for yourselves. You can make a choice. I'll say this, I think one of the saddest realities that we live in this world with is people that would refer to themselves as Christians, as followers of Christ, and yet are miserable. That we can be saved because we've received the Lord as our Lord and as our Savior, but we just stay stuck here in the pain in the betrayal, in the loss, our hearts are jaded, we hate people, we, 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 we're never excited, we're the victim of life. I just want to tell you today, because I love you enough to tell you, that you don't have to stay there. You can take a step in faith and receive healing for your pain and receive encouragement for your disappointments. And become whole for what, has, what life has robbed from you. You want to know why you have that opportunity? Because Jesus died for it. And he paid with his life to deliver you and to deliver me. And we don't have to live a life beaten, battered, and bruised. We can walk as conquerors in the victory that has been set before us through Christ Jesus. And so I pray your challenge today. To take a step in growth. To take a step towards the invitation of living with the fear of God. That when you choose to live this way comes all the rest of it. Proverbs 16.6 6 says, In mercy and in truth atonement is provided for iniquity. And by the fear of the Lord one departs from evil. How do we depart from evil? How, how, how do we beat temptation? Which by the way, you can beat your temptation. And here's another truth to your temptation. Just because you're tempted by it doesn't mean you are that. Just because you're tempted by something, you are not that temptation. Because even Jesus was tempted in Luke 4, time and time again, Jesus never gave in and Jesus never took on that identity. So you being tempted, it's just a, it's just a matter of this world we live in. It's a matter of the fallen world we live in. It's a matter of the curse of sin that we inherited. But through Jesus and through the fear of the Lord, we depart from evil. 
Amen. We can win. We can conquer. You can be set free from whatever it is you've been struggling and wrestling with. Psalm 112 verse 1. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord. Who delights greatly in his commandments. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord. Watch this word now. Delights in God's word. Delights in his commandments. Can I tell you today that there is a world where obedience stops being a burden and obedience starts being a joy? Early on in your walk with the Lord, everything that you're invited to is going to be resisted by your flesh. You read Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, and the virtues of the kingdom are in complete opposition to the virtues of this world. And so everything is going to bring resistance. But the more you grow, this is what we, call, what we call spiritual formation. We grow in Christ. We grow as sons and daughters. We grow in our faith and in our maturity. I'm not the same person that I was when I met him. I'm not the same person that I was a year ago. I've developed. I've grown. I let him prune me. You want to be challenged in your faith? Read John 15. You will be pruned in the hands of a loving father. And obedience can stop being a burden and becomes a delight. It becomes a joy. The God-fearing person not only obeys, but is greatly delights, greatly delights in doing so. The person who fears God always obeys. And within our obedience, we become unmovable in the biblical foundations that God calls us to. Through your obedience, we become unmovable in these truths. What truths? The truth that God is the one who knows me and what is right for me. We're immovable from that truth. The truth that God is pure love and I am to focus on his love. That God will never tell me to do anything that is detrimental. Whatever he says will always end up best. Come on. The truth that no matter what he says, I gladly choose to obey. Maybe you've been walking with Jesus for a certain amount of time in your life and you can look back at your life and be like, be like man, he, he knew better than me. Thank God that I said yes and I yielded and not did it my way. It's amazing the gratitude that is produced in us when we just look back at our lives. When we see the faithfulness of God. Some of us in this room got to thank God for ended relationships. Come on, somebody. Some of us got to thank God for closed doors. Some of us got to thank God for unanswered prayers. Things we were praying for that he spared us from. Come on. And so I, I want to just hone in on this trembling of God, at God's word through this idea of his word is my, is, is my authority. My authority is the word of God. I yield and I submit. I humble myself before his word. Amen. And through our obedience, we grow in the fear of God. So I want to give us five points today. I want you to lean in and take notes. A lot of points, a lot of scriptures. But here are the five, and then we'll break each one down. We obey God's word immediately. We obey God even when it doesn't make sense. We obey God when you don't see the personal benefit. We obey God even if it's painful. And we obey God to completion. Amen. Again, we're talking of how we respond to God's word. Number one, obey God immediately. We obey God immediately. I, I, I've, I've, I've been in moments where I haven't gotten this right all the time. I'm very analytical. I can be very slow to take a step. I like to just reason with God. I like to have everything on a whiteboard. I don't know if you're like me, but I like to be calculated but oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, there are promptings within us. There is a word within us that we are invited to act and not delay. Where God is speaking and we're like, ah, you know, we shiver back into our personality or we shiver back to our man-made fears or whatever that looks like. But obedience, like we've discussed from Philippians 2, is unconditional. And we obey God immediately. Obedience is a premium for those who fear God. You cannot say you fear God and you don't obey God. You don't have that luxury. You can't say you're a man of God and you don't have the fear of God. 
People that fear God don't put personal interest before fulfilling what God has told them to do. Holy fear instills in our hearts what is most important. What is most important to God becomes important to me. And these prayers will change in our lives as we begin to pray and spend time with the Lord. Because the Bible says that when you and I are born again, we are born again. And we receive a new heart, according to Ezekiel. That our old heart is put away and our new heart is put within us. That our mind is renewed. So with our minds being renewed and our heart being new, right now we talk different. Now we pray different. Now we ask for his ways to be my ways. Now we ask for his desires to become our desires. Amen. So it's his, what he cares about becomes important to us, becomes priority to us. And I want us to look at two statements from Jesus in Luke chapter 9. I'll read the text um, so we have the context, but I just want to point out these two verses in Luke 9, 59. The first part of the verse says, it says this, Then he said, talking about Jesus, to another man, follow me. The man responds in the second part of Luke 9, 59. But he said, Lord, let me first, let me first go and bury my father. Now this is a legitimate excuse. Right? I'm going to go bury my dad and then I'm going to go. However, the context of this is that the Hebrew tradition was, it wasn't solely about burying the father because he had just passed. It was about the ceremony of the burial. And the duty was for the firstborn sons to bury their fathers. And in the, the ceremony of the burial, they would receive a double portion of their inheritance. If they chose to forgo the ceremony or they buried him outside of the ceremony, the second in line can receive the portion of the inheritance. It's safe to say that Jesus knew this or recognized this in this specific instance. But think about the invitation. Jesus only gets denied one to two times in the New Testament where he asks somebody, come Lay down your life and follow me. Everybody else dropped what they were doing, dropped their nets, and followed Jesus. Let me think about the gravitas of that moment that the creator of the universe has just told you, hey, you can be a part of what I'm doing. And then because of life, they, we agree, but there's conditions to our agreement. It's like, that sounds great, but I first got to take care of this. That sounds amazing, but I got to delay for a minute. And in the delay, our personal interests, whether they're good or not, get in the way from our obedience unto God. And this man missed the opportunity. Luke 9, 57 through 62. Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. This is the church service. Then this is Tuesday. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds have the, have the air and have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then he said to another, follow me, church service. But he said, Lord, Tuesday, let me first go and bury my father. <laughs> Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, no one having to put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Hard words. Hard, difficult words. But the very next verse in chapter 10, verse 1, after these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also. And he sent them two by two before his face into every city and, every, and, and, and place where he himself was about to go. What's sad about these two verses is that these two men could have been part of the 70 that changed the world. And I know this is a big dramatic moment within these short few verses, but the whole point is that if we don't obey immediately, what are we missing out on that God has for us? I think about the rich young ruler who had everything in his life and Jesus says, hey, you have everything but one thing. In me, you can have this one thing. Leave it all behind. Sell your possessions. Follow me. And the young boy reflects on what he has. And the saddest scripture in the Bible, he walks back home. Because what he had was too great. 
and you missed out on being one of the 12. We think about this sometimes. Delayed obedience is not obedience at all. Delayed obedience is a lack of holy fear. When we are slow or neglect to obey God for any person, including ourselves, or purpose, we honor that person or purpose above honoring God. It's a lack of holy fear. Even when what is not sin takes precedence over the Lord, it becomes sin. Don't take what the Holy Spirit is telling you lightly or comically. And we've all been there, by the way, where it's like, man, you're never going to believe what I felt the Holy Spirit say to me. And we start laughing about it. Because it's so crazy. Or it's so absurd. Or we, we joke about it. We take it lightly. I pray that we grow from that. That when the Holy Spirit tells you something and you feel something, a prompting, that we don't laugh it off and say, God would never tell me to do that. That sounds wild to me. But that you lean in and do it. And that we're not delayed in our, obe in our obedience. <clears throat> there are people all throughout the Bible that had immediate obedience and others that delayed. And we see what happens in both what was missed, the opportunity that was forfeited. When we tremble at his word, we obey God immediately. If I delay my obedience to God's word for personal excuses, I communicate that his will is secondary in my in importance. That his will comes secondary in importance. We obey God immediately. Here's number two. Obey God even if it doesn't make sense. Come on. We obey God even when it doesn't make sense. Has the Holy Spirit ever led you to, to, to do something, come on, that didn't make sense? I've been there quite a few times where it's not adding up. Logic is not attached. It's not making sense. And yet, Every time I've said yes, I've seen him move in mighty ways. And maybe you have the same testimony. Maybe you have the same or similar story where in the moment it might not make sense, but when you live long enough, you can look back and say, wow, thank you, Jesus. And I'm glad I said yes. I wanted to ask a few questions to bring this point um, in context, but just in the life of Jesus and the scriptures that we read, I'm just going to rapid fire a few of these. Did it make sense to spit into dirt and put the mud on a blind man's eye and tell him to go wash it off? Did it make sense to pour water into wine containers in the middle of a wedding when what was needed was more wine? Did it make sense to instruct experienced sailors to go against their in instinct and training to not abandon a sinking ship when lifeboats were readily available? Did it make sense to walk around towering and fortified walls of a large city quietly for six days, then on the seventh day to do the same now with loud voices and trumpets? Does it make sense to forgive those who have hurt you, to forgive your family or someone close to you, when they deserve to pay for what they did? Does it make sense to love those who hate you when they deserve your cold shoulder? Does it make sense to do good to those who have mistreated you even though they deserve that you get even with them? Does it make sense to honor those who treat you dishonorably when they deserve to be told off? Come on, somebody. Why? Because the ways of the Lord are different from the ways of the world. Come on. And we are invited to live a life of obedience even when it doesn't make sense. Why? You and I are not from this world. We're born in this world. Yes, we are. But we are not from this world. You know where your citizenship is? It's in heaven. That's why the Bible says you and I are on a pilgrimage on this earth. That's why Ecclesiastes said this life is nothing but a vapor. It's here today, 
gone tomorrow. That's why Paul says, I'm a sojourner on this life. I've got a backpack on me. There's nothing that I won't leave behind because I don't belong here. I'm here on mission. I'm here on an assignment. I'm here to, to establish my home on this temporary Man, if you read 1 Corinthians 5, the Bible says that this life is like a tent. But that brick and mortar is in heaven. So what do we do when it doesn't make sense? I'm so glad you asked. My favorite Bible verse in all of Scripture, Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. I don't lean on my own nature. I don't lean on my own understanding because in my own nature and in my own understanding, I want to jump off the cross and handle things with my own hands. But in the ways of the cross and in the ways of the Lord, right, I, I, I lean to a different wisdom. I lean to a different spirit. It's his ways, not my ways. It's his thoughts, not my thoughts. And so what do we do when we can't forgive somebody? What do we do when I can't let somebody off the hook? What do we do when somebody betrayed me or backstabbed me? What do I do? I ask the Holy Spirit to give me his mind. I ask the Holy Spirit to give me his strength. I ask the Holy Spirit to make me meek when his strength under control. I ask for him to do what I cannot do within my own self. That's what we do. Because if it relies on you, you will never forgive somebody. If it relies on me, I will never forgive somebody. If it's my way... I will live bitter the rest of my life. If it's my way, I will work hard to get even. If it's my way. But thank God. Thank the Lord that we, there's a better way that we can opt into. And we can ask him for strength to forgive somebody. We can ask him for strength to battle temptation. We can ask him. To make us stronger where we are weak. Thank God we have a better way. And we can obey the Lord when it doesn't make sense. The person who fears God obeys even when it doesn't make sense. The Lord's wisdom far exceeds our own. And when we walk in holy fear, we can live this type of life. Is this helping us today? Here's number three. We obey God even when you don't see a personal benefit. You obey God even when there's nothing for you on the other side. And by the way, when you say yes to obedience, when you say yes to fearing God, because he's so good, there is always something in reward for you and me. However, this point matters so much is because it helps us evaluate our desires and our motives towards our obedience. Because if we obey God for what's the reward... Or we, when we obey God for the benefit, then we're truly not walking in holy fear. I thank God for my men's group at the Big Cheese. By the way, we took over the whole restaurant. I don't know what we're going to do. I don't know what we're doing on Wednesday, but we're doing something. But I love the conversations. For an hour, we're just talking about our motive and, and, and why we lead our business this way. And why we serve God and why we give and why we gave towards legacy because we're, we're checking our motives. We're checking our, 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 our desires that I do it for something else than to please God. That I do it for my own glory. Do I, do I do it for my own satisfaction? And I love these conversations and it's true in all of our lives, right? Do we obey God for our own gain? For our own benefits? The sad reality is that in the Western church, there's this false theology that we give to get. And, and, and we serve God because of the crowns we get in heaven or because of the rewards that are laid up for us. And although crowns are truth and rewards are truth, we don't do it for those things. We do it to please the Father. But if we're not careful... We, we, we put interests aside that emphasize only the benefits. And I pray we lean in and we evaluate this area as well. And ask ourselves, right? Because the global church has this problem. And listen, I've been serving the, the church for the better part of my whole life. 
It's hard to get people excited to hear a message on obedience or a message on holiness. It's hard to get people to buy the book about obedience or a book on holiness. Every time somebody asks me for a book, I love recommending one book. I recommend a lot, but this one book I recommend too. And everybody wants the book that's going to get them over the hump. And everybody wants the book that's going to light a fire in their soul and conquer what's before them. And there's books like that on the shelf. But the one that I always give is Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster. Read that. Rich, not very exciting. I know. Read it. Practice it. It will change everything. Because maybe what we don't need is another word that will tickle our ears or inspire our soul to run through walls. Maybe what we need is to learn how to lean into what makes us uncomfortable. Maybe what we need to do is learn how to pray and fast and seek his face. And as we do that, we become bigger and better in these areas that we're after. It's the obedience piece. It's the holiness piece. Let me tell you, people aren't buying tickets for that. But it's what the scriptures allow us to say and to know that if we can live a life where we learn how to deny ourselves and die to ourselves daily, we become like Jesus. Amen. Here's number four, obey God even if it's painful. We obey God even if it's painful. A.W. Tozer says, apart from obedience, there can be no salvation. For salvation without obedience is a self-contradictory impossibility. Jesus is the best example of obeying God, even if it is painful. He willingly obeyed the Father and what the Father was asking him in spite of the tremendous suffering that was on the other side. We're going to hear a lot of Matthew 26 in the next few days and weeks as we embark on Holy Week and Palm Sunday and Good Friday. But Matthew 26 is the night he's about to be betrayed and about to, he's about to lay his life down. In verse 39, he says this, the Bible says, he went on a little farther and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. We see the conflict that Jesus has between obedience and self-preservation. That it was so intense, the Bible says in the same chapter, that he was sweating blood from the intensity of this moment. What motivated Jesus' degree of obedience Hebrews 5, 7 reads, Who in those days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with vehement cries and tears to him, was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. There's that term again, holy fear, godly fear. The fear of God was so deep in Christ that it empowered him to face and endure what his human nature would run from. And in the same way, 1 Peter 4 tells us, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Arm yourselves with the mind of Christ. Amen. I'll just say this as we close. Past my time already. Is... It is a tragedy for us as believers to not develop a theology of suffering for ourselves. And I know I'm just making a statement, but I'll, we'll find time this year to just talk about this. But we all need to develop a theology for suffering, a healthy one, because we are not exempt from this world or from this life. And if Jesus had to endure the ultimate suffering, who are we to think that we won't? It's the fear of God that arms us with what we need to develop obedience no matter what suffering may entail. And here's the last one. Is this helping us today? We're blessed today? Here's the last one, number five, obey God to completion. Obey God to completion. Last week we talked about the fear of man and we used the example of King Saul's life. King Saul is a classic example of someone who doesn't tremble at God's word. He's easily straying from obedience when it doesn't make sense, when there's no benefits 
when the benefits aren't obvious to him or it didn't serve his own purpose. Obedience to completion is paramount to Jesus. Here's what I want to end with is thank God Jesus didn't quit. Thank God he didn't quit. Thank God he persevered and he followed through and he was obedient to completion. Jesus could have avoided the gruesome treatment, the brutal death, but rather chose to continue in obedience until we can finally say it is finished. And Jesus is who we live after, by the way. He's our example. He's our model. And Jesus sets the example for us to fully obey, to finish whatever God has entrusted to us. What has God entrusted to you? What has God put in your hands to complete and to be obedient in? It's not always the big grand things, and they could be. Maybe he's called you to plant a church. Maybe he's called you to lead a movement. Maybe he's called you to become a missionary. Maybe he's called you to raise your babies in the ways of the Lord. Maybe he's called you to live a God-glorifying business. Maybe he's called you to do the big and the small. But what has he entrusted you with? That's a big question. That he's asking you to not just obey in the beginning, but to obey to complete it. It's easy in the beginning when you're excited and you got fresh vision to say, yes, Lord, I'll go. It's a whole other thing You're when you're five years in and you've been through some stuff, you've gone through some things, where now it's like, ah, oh, maybe I miss God. Maybe I didn't hear him clearly. Maybe there's a better way. Don't throw in the towel. Stay the course. Obey to complete. I preach this message really throughout COVID, the COVID years. It's amazing it's been four years already called uh, sailboats and scrapbooks and I talked about how God is very into the details of your life however God will never give you details about your future because God is not in the detail business God is in the direction business God knows all the details but he won't reveal the details to you and I always what he does tell us is hey go this way and as you go this way I'm with you why does he not give us the details, Rich? Because if he were to give you all the details of your future, some of us would stay right in the shore. I want none of that. I want none of those endless nights. I want none of those insufficient fund fees. I want none of those lawsuits. I want none of those broken relationships. I want none of those betrayals. I want none of these legal fees. I'm going to just stay right here. Thank God he's not a detail giver. He's a direction giver. And when he gives us direction, it's by faith we take steps. And it's every day. It's, this, this is what we say. It's daily obedience, y'all. It's not once a year January 1st obedience. It's a daily dying to ourselves obedience. And every day, Lord, when it don't make sense, I'm going to obey. God, when it, when it doesn't add up, I'm going to obey. Even if it's painful, I'm going to obey. E -e -e even, even if it's hard, I'm not going to delay. I'm immediate in my obedience. This is why when we live like this every day, it's the truth that settles our soul that he's with you and that he goes before you and that he's been in your tomorrow. Man, if I can just, it's dark out there, but if I can see the, the white of your eyes and if you can see my eyes, do you truly believe that God has been in your tomorrow? Do you truly believe that he has a plan for you, that your steps are ordained? Get past the churchness of that slogan and let it sink into your soul and come to grips that your steps are ordained by God and that he's been in your tomorrow. And God will never guide you to your demise 
and where he guides, he provides. And so take a step of faith today and obey to completion and wake up every day and make a decision. Whether it makes sense, whether it's painful, whether I don't understand, whether there's benefits or there's not, I will go where you go. I will do what you say. This is, come on, living a life of holy fear. And when you tremble at God's word, And I'll finish with this scripture. I know I've said that three scriptures ago. This is the last one, I promise. Amen. So the last verse, come on somebody. I promise, it is the last verse. I'm not making this up, there's no more. (laughs) Luke 17, 10. The disciples have a moment that I think we can all have. And I get emotional, I got emotional at the nine, and I get emotional with this service too, with this scripture. Verse 10, so likewise you, when you have done all those things, say all those things, which you are commanded, say, 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 we are unprofitable servants who have done what was our duty to do. When all the things God asks you to do are done, say, I'm an unprofitable servant. I didn't do it for my gain. I didn't do it for my benefit. I didn't do it from what was on the other side. I did what was my duty to do. Almost complete obedience is not obedience. Almost did it. Almost got there. Choose to obey the Lord today to completion. Would you stand with me? Come on, I know it's 1230 and we got to wrap it up. But I just want to have a moment today as we worship and dismiss Just for a moment, if you can just close your eyes so that we can go from congregational to personal. Because I truly believe that there are people in this room that are far from God. and Maybe today you're looking for transformation. You're looking for change. Maybe you've believed in God or maybe you haven't. But today you know that he's speaking to you. And you feel him and you're encountering his presence. And you're asking what to do. You're asking what's next. I want to encourage you today that what's next is for you to fully surrender your life to Jesus. And you do that through the confession of your words. And posturing your soul to say, Lord, you become my God. You become my Lord. You become my Savior. And here's what happens when you say yes to this moment. Everything Jesus died on the cross for and finished for you becomes yours. Life, hope, peace, purpose, forgiveness of sin, life in heaven when you leave this earth, that is the gospel and that is the finished work of the cross and that is available for you, your family today, today. And so if you're here this morning and you're saying, Rich, I want to change my life and I want to surrender to Jesus, would you raise your hand all over this room? Come on, this is a step of faith, a step of faith today. You're saying, this is me. Here I am, Lord. I'm here. I want change and I want to know you. If you're online today, come on, this is your moment. You can lean in right where you are and say, this is it. I'm giving my life to Christ in Jesus' name. Come on, praise God. Praise God. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray these words all together. And if you raise your hand or if you know this moment is for you, pray these words with boldness, with conviction, with passion today, knowing, come on, that the, that the Father, that Christ Jesus is here before you and that everything's about to change. You ready to pray, church? Come on, you ready to pray with me? Come on, repeat after me. Say, Jesus, today I give you my life and I fully surrender. I repent of my sin and I receive 
the free gift of forgiveness. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for resurrecting for me. Because you live, I now live. Be my Lord and be my Savior. I love you. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, church. Come on, he's here. He's good. And I'm so excited. If today you prayed those words for the first time or for the first time in a long time, welcome home. I've got some resources for you and your family, Bibles, a book called Following Jesus right outside of that welcome tent. Fill out a connect card. Let us know who you are. Let us come alongside you and walk this journey in Christ together. Amen. I'm going to ask our worship team to close out in song, and our prayer team is here. You can respond today by receiving prayer. Whatever you're needing today, whatever you're believing for, our team is ready to believe with you, pray with you, and I'm excited for all that is to come. Amen. Were you blessed today? We're going to walk out of here with our benediction prayer. We're going to believe we're walking out of here in victory and with the Lord's blessing. So pray with me, church. Come on. The Lord bless me and keep me. The Lord make his face shine on me and be gracious to me. The Lord turn his face toward me and give me peace. I love you, church. Our altar is open for prayer. If you got to stay in worship, stay. You got to stay and pray, stay. And we'll see you at the Easter meeting right in here in a minute.
Yeah.